All right, friends, it's two o'clock Eastern, one o'clock Central. We do have some more people rolling in, but let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Pinnacle Financial Partners educational webinar, the IRS doubles down on FSAs, protecting your pre-tax plan. Um, a couple of things to note before we begin. Everyone is muted. Uh, we do want you to interact and have questions and ask questions. Like we're gonna play a game, we're gonna have fun. So I encourage you to chat if that feels good to you. Um, so looking for the chat function. And uh, you can send a message to everyone if you're feeling super chatty. You can ask questions just to hosts and panelists, like whatever feels good to you. We're here to support that. Um, the session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email. And our presentation has been approved for continuing education credits for HR professional designations. And a certificate of, of completion along with the activity code will be emailed to participants who attend the live event. One of our core values here is learning, which is why we host these events. Um, because we want to give distinctive service and effective advice, hands down. That's the most important thing. We are a top 50 bank headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. We have uh, physical offices located across the Southeast, and we have health and benefit advisors strategically placed throughout the United States to help our clients with their um, health and benefit needs and tax advantaged plan needs. We offer a full range of banking, investment, trust, mortgage, and insurance products to employer groups and to individuals who want a comprehensive relationship with their financial institution. So just a quick disclaimer, uh, the information that we provide to you today could change tomorrow. It could change this afternoon. I mean, really anytime. Uh, so this is what we know to be true as of right now, uh, September 13th, 2023. The information that we provide to you is for educational purposes. We're not providing any specific legal, tax, financial, or medical advice. So please consult your legal counsel or your tax advisor for your particular circumstance. I may look different to you uh, than most of you know me. Hi, it's me. Uh, my name is Fern and I am the compliance officer here on the Pinnacle Health and Benefits team. I have been in the employee benefit and insurance space for about 15 years. If you're a Pinnacle client, we've probably met. If you've been to one of our events before that I've led, um, which I love, I hope that we have had an opportunity to chat. Um, and you might be thinking like, why is Fern dressed like that um, in the video? If you're attending the live event and you have uh, your video up, um, this is Pinnacle's new uniform for legal and compliance uh, folks. <laughs> uh, I'm totally just kidding. Uh, it's pertinent, it ties into the webinar, we're gonna play a game, we're gonna have fun. But just know that like the closest thing that I am to this, which I'm just not cool enough for, maybe one day I will be, is this. Um, I own a Peloton, I live really close to a biker bar, my Peloton goes nowhere fast. Um, the biker bar is close enough that I could ride my road bike that you see in this picture up there. Um, they're all super nice, but yeah, it's got a basket, it's got a bell, it's got flowers on it. Um, I do wear a helmet, cause you know, safety first, compliance, ball the wall. Um, but yeah, just super fun. But before we get into the game, um, I do wanna talk about definitions because the whole webinar really is centered around IRS substantiation with FSA plans. So what is a flexible spending account? Um, well, it's a tax-advantaged health plan funded by employer dollars, employers underlined for a reason here, uh, used to pay for qualified medical expenses. We are going to touch on dependent care FSAs just a smidge, um, in addition to health FSAs and limited purpose dental and vision FSAs. Um, just know it's not a health plan, but it's still employer funds. And the reason that employer here is so important, um, you know, most employers don't contribute to these plans, but they do open up the plan and sponsor the plan to allow employees to put in their own pre-tax dollars from their payroll contributions. But the way that the IRS sees this money, as soon as it is um, separated from employee payroll contributions, is it becomes employer money. It is employer money used to fund a plan. Um, so that's really important. Oftentimes it can cause a little bit of confusion. 
like we get questions a lot where people will ask us, hey, you know, my employees didn't use all their flexible spending account money in the plan year. Can I just give them the money back? And the answer is no. It no longer was their money, the money that you put it in plan assets and then in the employer assets as well. Um, it also is really important that this is employer dollars because employers are the ones that are responsible for maintaining plan compliance here. Um, unlike HSAs and health savings accounts, where when we think about things like substantiation, which we're going to talk about, um, health savings accounts, making sure that your expense is qualified is on the participant to do it. It's on the employee to make sure that they're complying. Whereas with FSAs, it's the employer. So a health FSA is an employer plan, just like a medical plan. So we're going to talk about substantiation, but really what is that? Um, essentially, all reimbursements must be proven to be a qualified expense in order to be eligible for tax deferment. Um, in other words, we need a receipt for every claim. Um, and receipt here is in quotations because I'm going to use it throughout the webinar. Um, I use it in common everyday vernacular, but really a better word is documentation. And the reason that I say that is because you might get a credit card receipt um, after you go to the vision doctor, and it might not have everything that the IRS requires to be on the documentation um, in order to be considered eligible or be considered a good enough receipt. So when we talk about that, um, most plans offer debit cards to participants so that they can have money on hand rather than pay out of pocket first and submit documentation for reimbursement after the fact. But I just want everyone to know that like a debit card swipe and a manual claim are both claims. They're both considered health plan claims. Um, and so the IRS requires proper documentation to confirm that the expense was eligible. So let's talk about receipt requirements. Um, there are five things that are needed per the IRS for an administrator to even consider whether or not an expense is eligible. Um, and this would be true for people who go use their HSA for things as well. Um, and like a quick shout out to one of our health and benefit advisors, Laura, who created this amazing handout, a uh, print on demand card for our clients so that our consumers can keep this inside their wallet alongside their FSA debit card so that they know they're prompted for the things as a reminder that the IRS requires. So the first thing we need is the date of service, not necessarily the date that you paid. Um, they might be the same, but they might not be the same, but we actually need to know when you went to the doctor. We need to know a description of the service. Did you go get your eyes checked? Did you have a vision exam? Great, we need to know that. We need to know the name of the provider. Um, which doctor did you go to? Just so that we know you actually went to a real doctor to get a medical uh, treatment. The name of the patient, is it the employee or is it the uh, a tax dependent? Is it a spouse? And we also need to know the dollar amount charged, like what you were responsible for paying. Um, and yeah, every receipt doesn't have this on there. And you might also wonder like, why do you need to know so much? Uh, this feels like HIPAA data, it, it is. Um, and employers do sign contracts and give us information um, and give us as your plan administrator, like we need that information and the IRS allows it as well. But we obviously maintain that with a huge amount of privacy and care. But like, so maybe that doesn't make sense to you. Um, why would I need all this information to confirm whether or not a claim is good? Um, well, let's like switch it. Let's just think it differently. Let's think about ex employee expense reports. So I've worked at companies where a company will give me a credit card and then they'll ask me to validate my travel expenses after the fact. So I'll just submit receipts to my employer and be like, thanks for the credit card, bro. I'm gonna give you all these receipts and just, you know, you can see that they're absolutely valid. Um, this is kind of the same thing when we think about debit cards. Um, the company determines which, which expenses are eligible, like flights, meals, lodging, um, has to be for a travel expense. I can't go to downtown Nashville um, and buy five pairs of boots and use a Pinnacle credit card for that and be like, hey, travel expense, right? Um, the other way that these are handled is that you will uh, file a manual claim and you'll submit it for reimbursement after the fact. So I pay upfront with my debit card and I will uh, submit reimbursement 
documentation and then wait to be reimbursed from the company. So, so let's just treat this FSA the same way. Um, as you can imagine, it's easier to control expenses on the back end with manual claims, but it does put employees who can't pay up front at a disadvantage. And this is true of FSA plans. So, you know, not necessarily get rid, don't get rid of debit cards, um, but people are just going to be more assertive in making sure that they have the proper receipts, proper documentation, um, if they're requesting reimbursement on the back end. All right, so let's, we've kind of gone over the FAQs. Um, let's talk about this memo that the IRS sent out this year in April. Um, essentially, they repeated all those rules again in the memo, and we were like, hey, like, you said this 3,500 times. Why are you repeating yourself? And they're like, yeah, we said what we said 3,500 times, except for this time, we didn't say it to carriers. We didn't say it to insurance uh, people, brokers, lobbyists. We didn't say it to administrators. We released this memo to businesses. Why do we think this is important? Um, businesses are the employers, generally speaking, who are hiring the TPAs to manage these plans. It's the employer who's responsible for maintaining plan compliance. Um, so that, number one, is why it's important that it was released to businesses this time. Um, also, the IRS allotted $80 billion for audit enforcement last year with the Inflation Reduction Act with the intention of enforcing rules and auditing people. So when they release this memo to businesses, who do you think that they're auditing? Anyone want to throw that in the chat? No pressure, because um, I'm going to tell you. Uh, they're auditing businesses, uh, corporate entities. They're auditing employers. And this is new because they've never really enforced these rules as far as substantiation goes until now. So we're going to go through all that, like what all that really means. Uh, just now, know now that like this is a really good time to think about like, oh, my gosh, am I doing all these things? Because it's real. It's here. So there is a phenomenon called pay and chase. And in layman's terms, that means that you pay with your debit card and your administrator chases you for documentation. So that's that, that's that. I have the money on the front end, I pay for it. And you're gonna have to submit the documentation after the fact. The opposite being manual claims where you don't have a card. And when we met with the IRS in August, they actually said to us, you know, I mean, debit cards don't really work very well with FSA plans. They're not saying get rid of them. They're just stating the obvious. It's a little harder to manage. Um, but the IRS also says that if you're going to offer a debit card, there's a set of steps that you have to follow in order to maintain compliance with them. Um, so I'm gonna show you steps one through three. There's four steps, but steps one through three can kind of be used interchangeably, um, kind of in any specific order. But the first thing you're required to do is to suspend the debit card. Um, this is the red flag. This is anybody's red flag. When you go to use your bank card or a card somewhere to use it and it doesn't work, automatically you're going to call the number on the back of the card, right? And be like, why is my card not working? Um, that's when a claims examiner or whoever is authorized at the administrator to tell you, oh, you know, you had a denied debit card claim. We had to suspend your debit card. Now, most administrators, not to scare everybody, but most administrators do have a courtesy list, meaning like if you're standing in line at CVS and you're waiting on a like life-saving medication or a medication in general, nobody really asks you, but you just need your card to work, they can lift it for 24 hours. Um, giving you time, you get your medication and they give you time to go back to the doctor who you saw when you swiped your card 60, 90, 100 days ago, however long that was. Um, and that gives you your opportunity to unsuspend your card. Now, if we denied the claim, which would make the card be suspended, we would request repayment because we didn't know whether or not the expense was eligible to start with. Um, that means you're supposed to repay the plan. And those funds will become eligible again uh, once you have put that, once you've paid it back, it kind of goes back into your umbrella money. So once you have another eligible expense, you can swipe your card, it's, it's back available to you. And then the third step is to submit a manual claim and it offsets a denied claim. 
So ultimately, if your card is suspended, uh, you have a repayment out there, you want to submit a manual claim for reimbursement, that claim is going to pay the plan back before it pays you. Um, so again, steps one through three really work simpatico together with the ultimate goal of getting employees to provide proper documentation for their expenses, okay? Steps one through three don't work. You are supposed to tax the employee um, at the end of the plan year after all the run out periods are over because essentially the IRS sees this as gross taxable income. It wasn't an eligible medical expense. How would they know? They never sent the documentation in. Um, so this is supposed to be submitted and included in an employee's box one of their W-2. Now, I want you to know that step four is what the IRS is looking for. Um, steps one through three help get you to a lower like taxable amount because throughout the year, employees are made aware that they have things they need to take care of. But ultimately, if it wasn't taken care of, the employee is supposed to be taxed. All right, so now we know why I'm dressed like this a little bit. We're gonna play a game, um, just because I like dressing like this. Uh, we're gonna play a game called Play and Chase. I had a dream while I was workshopping uh, my idea for the webinar that I was riding motorcycles and that I was late to the presentation, which is kind of like everybody's worst nightmare, at least it's one of mine. And I came here and I presented, I didn't even flip my, uh, my helmet up <laughs> and everyone seemed to like it. So uh, yeah, that's what we went with. Now I'm very aware that these are not motorcycles. These are pink Vespas, which is probably more up my alley. Um, but just know that like they were free on the internet and we could use them for use with copyright law. So that's what we went with. I'm all about following the rules, right? So this game, Play and Chase, is like Churchill Downs. Um, if you've ever gone to a fair, you've ever gone to a circus and like you have that big game board, sideshow board where like the horses kind of flow across the screen and like the faster they go based on how quickly you throw the balls in the hole. This is the same idea. Step four, I just want you to ride into the sunset. At the end of the plan year, you get your money. That's it. That's all I want from this game. So everyone's going to have like fair opportunity here to win. Uh, you don't have to choose a team. We're all going to play together. Why are there five scooters? This is very intentional. The IRS said that um, after they told us all the rules in the memo, they gave us um, five very specific scenarios. And within those scenarios, they said, hey, you can't do this, or this is a common misconception, or hey, you can do this. Um, so we're gonna go through those. And yeah, we hope someone wins. That's, that's the point of the game, pay and chase. All right, let's start with player one down here at the bottom. Let's swipe our debit card. All right, so situation one on the FAQ was Evil Knievel. Um, Evil goes to the eye doctor and swipes his card. Bloop. Uh, by the way, that's the sound our cards make when you swipe them, so they're super fun. Uh, <laughs> Evil forgets to ask for documentation with the appropriate information. Um, instead, Evil decides to write his own receipt and then submit it to the carrier, submit it to the administrator. And here's how it reads. To whom it may concern, Evil Knievel went to ABC Vision, located at 123 Crescent Lane, on August 28, 2023, and Evil paid $230 for an eye exam. Thanks. Sign Evil. Okay, so we know the patient was Evil, number one. We know they went to ABC Vision. We know that it was incurred, they went there on August 28th of 2023, where Evil, the patient again, paid uh, $230 for an eye exam. So we have all five things here. We know all the information that is required from the IRS. Um, what do we think, team? Do we think that this is a good enough receipt? You send in the chat, no. I love seeing all these no's, because <laughs> that's right. Um, why do we think that? Here's why. Evil signed it himself. Um, situation one, exactly, not from a doctor. Uh, 
self-certification is not allowed. You can't write your own receipt without validation from a third party. And third parties are providers and insurance carriers. No go, man. No go. Evil can't even leave the go. So, boo. Um, player number two is Harley Davidson. Um, again, I know these aren't Harleys. And I know that that's a very specific brand. So, like, kudos. Much respect. <laughs> um, Harley goes to the same uh, eye doctor as evil. Bloop. They swipe their card. They are provided with documentation. So Harley gets the documentation they need, but they're never asked to submit it to the administrator. That's okay. Wow. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that's great. Uh, but in this specific situation, it was needed. Um, the reason that Harley was never asked for the documentation is because the administrator does something called claim sampling, um, which basically means only a percentage of the claims are reviewed for eligibility. So not all of them, just you know, a portion of them, a percentage. All right, so Harley thinks that Harley's in the clear. His debit card was never suspended. He just keeps swiping, save the receipt forever. That's right, save, for, save forever, at least seven years. Um, he just keeps swiping without a care in the world. Do we think that Harley is okay? No, bunch of no's. Yep, not at all. Um, well, here's the deal. Um, Harley isn't okay. Let me tell you why. Claim sampling is not allowed. This is not Harley's fault, by the way. Um, all claims must be substantiated not just a handful of them. So, um, boo for Harley. Uh, they go back to, they never even really like get to go anywhere either. So stuck at the starting point. Um, alrighty, so now we have player three. This is our friend Helen Wheels. Um, Helen has a super fun license plate, which I believe reads Helen Wheels um, for sure. So we're talking about our friend Helen, situation, <laughs> situation three. Uh, Helen goes to the same eye doctor because like all of her friends go there. Um, Helen's card swipe was for $35. Um, Helen was never asked for a receipt from her TPA because the employer um, alongside the TPA decided to implement something called a de minimis threshold. Uh, the requested TPA, uh, did not request documentation for expenses under $100. So like anything under $100, just you're good. You're totally fine. Who cares? Buy whatever you want. Um, how do we feel about Helen? Do we feel like Helen's gonna have a good day um, at the end of the plan year? <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, Helen's not gonna have a good day. Um, and again, it depends on if, if the plan's audited, but you know, we know they're auditing, so yeah, we'll see what the IRS says. Situation three, de minimis substantiation. You may not set a dollar amount under which you don't substantiate claims. There you go. Helen's not good. Helen goes back to start. All righty, guys, we're, we're, we're kind of getting into the bottom of the buckets here. So let's talk about player four. Um, so player four goes to see their very, very favorite provider. It's everybody's favorite provider, Dr. Feelgood. Uh, they call her Dr. Feelgood because she's the one that makes you feel all right. There's like Motley Crue wrote a song about Dr. Feelgood, world renowned, well known, amazing. Um, they don't ask Dr. Feelgood for receipts because everyone likes Dr. Feelgood and just knows that they're super honest on the up and up, amazing. Um, this seems legit. I mean, this seems like the most legit out of all of them, right? So let's talk about this real quick. Um, let's just imagine that Dr. Feelgood is everyone's favorite, like, radiologist. Um, everyone goes to her in case they have, like, a scrape. Maybe they did a tumble on their bike. Uh, just want to make sure you didn't break an arm, right? Um, radiologists can only do qualified expenses, x-rays, scans, things that show whether or not you have a broken bone. Um, why should you have to submit a receipt if you go to Dr. Feelgood, who is a radiologist? Um, and is this even okay? Like, this seems fine. Favored providers. This is a question the IRS gets all the time. The myth here is busted. 
You can do this. Um, but it is a good question. And we even talked to the IRS about this. Like, why, why would you need something from a radiologist? We know better. Um, you go swipe your card there. The MCC code on the card machine tells us that's at a radiologist. We get that information. But there's no other reason you would go there. You can't go get teeth bleaching or something that's not eligible. Well, it really just starts with the fact that one, the IRS says so, and we have to listen to them, but that's boring. Um, we don't actually know when you went to the doctor. We only know the date that you paid. So it's very possible that like you, your plan year runs from January 1 to December 31st. Uh, you go to the doctor on December 31st, but like you don't have any more FSA dollars. You pay them with your FSA in the next plan year and you just can't do that. And it's not that people are trying to be shady. It's just that like that's when the money's there. And so that's why TPAs have to validate those expenses. Um, and that's why you can't have favored providers. Now, one thing we did ask them, we were like, well, what if we sign a contract with a favored provider? And like, you know, you have contractual things there that kind of make sure that everyone's following the rules and the IRS just kind of like shrugged a little bit. So like, I wouldn't really bank on it, uh, but just know that we advocate for ease of doing business, even though we have to enforce the rules. All right, so doctor patients, uh, doctor feel good patients don't feel so good. Um, all right, so guys, let's let's try number five. Number number five has to be lucky because they have to win it for everyone. Um, let's talk about dependent care. So this little biker baby um, can hold up this incredibly heavy bike, uh, <laughs> but despite that, despite their super strength, they have to be uh, they can't be left alone during the day. They have to go into dependent care, uh, daycare. Their parents basically know because daycare is so expensive that like by the middle of their plan year, they're gonna have used all their $5,000, which makes perfect sense because it's expensive. Um, so their administrator says to them, hey, you know, just submit this form that says, I'm definitely gonna spend $5,000 this year. So just go ahead and give me that $5,000, that's fine. Um, I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense because you're definitely going to spend that money. Um, but what do we think about this? Do we feel like this seems legit? Do we think that uh, it's okay to submit, like, just, you know, fill out a form and say, hey, hey, give me my $5,000 in the middle of the year? No. Okay, let's find out. So also wrong, um, that's right, services have to be rendered. So you can't advance substantiate. You can't just tell your administrator you're gonna incur an expense. You actually have to prove and provide the documentation. So um, we went through these five scenarios and nobody like went past go. So like, um, you know, we lose. Um, you're not losers, I lost with you, uh, we lost the game. Um, that's no fun, but just know that like, that doesn't bring me any joy. Like I want everyone to win their money. I want not even win your money, just get the money back that you contributed to the plan. Um, we all do, but here's the deal. Like this is the IRS. The IRS is the one making people feel bad. <laughs> it's not me. Um, and again, when we talk to the IRS, um, I'll, yeah, Sue, I'll talk to you about that, about the prescription drugs. There's, we're going to have some little tips in here to talk about how to make this okay. Um, when we meet with the IRS, uh, they get it. Like, their whole mood, um, it's, it's kind of ironic and funny. They know that it's expensive. Um, they know that it's difficult, and they know it's time-consuming. Um, but they were just kind of like, eh, you want to do it. You got to play the rules. Like, you want the money, you got to play the game. I mean, that is their whole job, right, um, to make sure that the people who are claiming tax uh, deductions are actually, like, doing the right thing, that they're eligible. Now, here's where it gets, a, like, worse. <laughs> if you as the employer have expenses on a denied claims report at the end of the year and you didn't tax the participants who uh, didn't validate their expenses, what we know right now is that um, if the IRS were to audit you, and like they're gonna audit you for a period of time, they're not usually gonna audit you for forever. 
Um, but if they audit you, they're disqualifying entire plans for that period of time, which basically means you're taxed on all of your expenses, not just those that were invalid. So like when I say the IRS is a vibe, like this is their vibe. Um, and I hope that they don't watch this and like come after me because that's my biggest fear. <laughs> other than showing up late to webinars. Um, but here's what we know. Um, right now, based on feedback from other industry professionals, because here at Pinnacle, knock on wood, crossing our fingers, doing all the juju dances, we have not had any clients who this has happened to yet. Um, so other industry professionals have told us, like, they're not disqualifying the plan back to plan inception, which is great. Um, for right now, just for the period of time that they're auditing for, uh, we know that this applies to FSA expenses. We don't know if it applies to other things as well in terms of like, you know, usually your FSA is in a 125 document with other benefits. Like, does it disqualify HSAs in there? Probably not, but it could. I mean, they could disqualify your whole 125 plan if they wanted to. Um, another thing that we know is that it's the employer who's being asked to pay for this and that there are penalties associated with it. We don't know what those penalties are. We know they're not coming after employees um, yet. That's not to say they could not, but they aren't doing that yet. Um, so yeah, that's what we know right now, which is very, very little. Uh, when we met with the IRS in August, we did ask about enforcement. Um, so that takes us to enforcement. And the people that we usually talk to are the ones who write the memos. Uh, not the people who are out there doing the digging. So here's what we do know. Uh, we don't believe that the IRS is coming around like the Department of Labor does and just auditing plans. Uh, DOL has a long track record of doing that. Um, so we know that this is coming from corporate tax audits. And so there's probably something that they looked for on a corporate tax return uh, that flew up a red flag. And as a result, now they're requesting a ton of information from you, including plan information on your flexible spending accounts. Um, plan documents, probably. We'll talk about that in a minute. We don't know exactly what they're asking for, but we do know that they're asking for proof of taxation if claims weren't eligible. So um, not a ton of information. We're, good, we're finding it out, so hopefully we'll do a follow-up to this. Um, this is brand new. They've never done this before. So what should you do? Because all this is new. Uh, so number one, we want you to follow the substantiation rules, number one. Um, number two, it's our job here as an administrator to help you increase substantiation, um, help employees understand the rules. So that's number two. You want to like get your auto substantiation up. And number three, maintaining plan compliance. There is more than just making sure that you're substantiating claims, okay? There's other stuff that the IRS requires for you to have and to do in order to have a compliant plan. All right, so let's talk about that first bullet point, following the substantiation rules. So we talked about this already, steps one through three, just make sure you're doing these things. Um, doesn't have to be in any specific order. You're just really thinking about, at the end of the day, you don't want to tax the employee for expenses that they did not substantiate. So follow those rules. You're good there. You're good there. Now let's talk about how do we actually increase substantiation? Uh, because all in all, it, it can be kind of onerous and a grumpy task. I get grumpy doing it, let's just be fair. Uh, number one, you can do this with claim file feeds. We'll talk about those, setting up co-payment validation, um, increasing employee education. We'll give you some tips and tricks there. And also making sure that you get reporting. Like we may not be your administrator, so if it's somebody else, make sure you're getting reporting, super important. All right, claims file feeds. What is a claim file feed? Well, you can see here we have an insurance company. You can see on the other side of the road, you have an FSA administrator. Um, a claim file feed is where secure claim data comes over via secure file transfer, and that information feeds over to the FSA administrator. Um, <laughs> that kid's a maniac. Uh, what the system will do is automatically look for card swipes that occurred at a medical dental vision provider, depending on what type of insurance you link up with the TPA. 
Um, and it will look for a card swipe on that same date of service with that same dollar amount and auto substantiate it on the back end. Um, most of the time, employees don't even know that this happens. So, like, that's amazing. You know, I no one want, really wants to lift a finger. I don't. I want this to be easy. So let's make it easy. It's almost like an automatic EOB that comes over. Um, and then in the event there is no match um, with the file feed that comes over, then the employee just has to provide their own documentation, whether that's a walkout statement, um, something from their provider, uh, whether that's an insurance carrier EOB as well. And file feeds are amazing. Copayment validation. So if you have a PPO plan, let's say you have a health plan and it's a PPO, most of them are gonna have like a set amount that you pay to go to certain doctors. You know, $50 for specialists, 75 urgent care, 250 emergency room, you pay uh, a copayment for pharmacy. What you would wanna do is tell this to your administrator and they can build these amounts in the system so that we know when Evil Knievel goes to the eye doctor and swipes his card for 50 bucks, we're gonna know automatically that's a copayment and we just automatically validate it for you. Um, there are also some other things that we do on our side, like we'll allow this to go up to three times. So let's say Evil has two children and they all have eye exams, that's $150. We're gonna auto substantiate that. Um, other things that we do, um, if you go to a dentist one time and you swipe your card for, uh, let's say it's not a copayment, because a lot of dentists don't really have networks where this works. You swipe your card for $238 one time. Let's say you go there again and you spend $238. Our system is going to see that as the exact same expense and auto substantiate it. So there's some really cool things that your administrator can do for you to make sure that this um, runs a little smoother. Ongoing education. Um, first of all, your plan materials should be available in writing and also in multiple formats. Um, if you can, videos, webinars, um, inviting your advisors to come to enrollment meetings, talk to employees, like have them call people. This education is really important and people all learn different ways. So thinking about the generations across your company, like how do people learn best? Um, I know that most people don't read past the first like two sentences of a paragraph. So like hit the high level stuff quick, bullet points, fast, pointed, like this card. Uh, information that people can really consume quickly makes it a lot better. Other things that um, really make a difference, because there was a question about prescription drugs. Um, if you go to a, a pharmacy that is in something called an IIAS network, and most of your most pharmacies are, um, what that means is that they've met the criteria per the IRS to offer all offer prescriptions. Um, and then any other kind of over-the-counter expense that the IRS considers eligible, when you as a participant go swipe your card there, it's automatically going to be allowed. You don't have to submit any more documentation for it. So, um, you know, asking your pharmacist if they're in the IIAS network or the CGIS network, and if they are, you should really have no problems with eligible expenses at your pharmacy where you have to substantiate those on your own. It's automatically gonna come over to your administrator. So that's great. Um, now let's talk about reporting. Um, so what we know, well, first of all, knowledge is power. So you should be getting reports anyway. Um, but we know that the IRS is gonna ask you in an audit for denied claims report, in claims report most likely, and maybe other information that you might have to, to have available. Um, so making sure that your administrator can provide these reports, um, they can either be run by your administrator and given to you, or maybe something that you can run on your own. Um, maybe it shows claims that are in repayment statuses, or maybe they're just outright denied. And while you as the administrator can't ask employees specifically about like any HIPAA information, um, like why'd you go to the doctor and why didn't you pay your claim? You could say, hey, you know, I, we've got some reporting. Um, I'm just curious if you're having problems substantiating anything with our administrator, like maybe maybe give them a call. That's it. That's easy enough. And we have that happen. I'm sure all administrators have that happen. And like, we're happy to help. Like, we want you to get your money and education is power. And I think that we are in a really great position to help people understand um, how to navigate all these requirements. 
All right. Do you follow substantiation rules? You're working on increasing substantiation. We're doing really good. So now we just have to make sure that we as employers are maintaining our plan compliance um, in addition to substantiation. So number one, um, in order to offer any of these plans, you're required to have a plan document. And you should probably review all your documents and materials annually. Um, you may make changes. You just need to make sure that they're noted in your legal plan documents. Um, we don't know if the IRS is asking for plan documents in an audit. Um, I can tell you, in my experience, before all the substantiation stuff, um, so many years ago, um, I have had a few clients who were going through a corporate tax audit and they were asked for an FSA document or a premium only plan document or a section 125 document. Um, so I do know they ask for it. Um, it's just that it's super duper rare. It was super duper rare to start with. So I would probably bear on the side of yes, they're probably gonna ask you for that because they're not gonna know to ask for FSA claims reports if they don't know if you offer an FSA plan. Um, so have a plan docu document, make sure it's up to date. Number two, follow your actual written plan rules. Um, not just what's in your plan documents, but like your open enrollment guides, your handbooks, like you wanna make sure that stuff matches each other just to one, avoid confusion. Um, you know, an employee who is having a struggle very well could be like, I want all of our written plan materials and they might read them. Um, so you just want to make sure it matches and that you're actually doing what you've said on paper. Number three, pre-tax plans are required to perform annual non-discrimination testing each year. Um, and that's to confirm whether or not a plan is discriminatory. And discriminatory here changes based on the IRS code because of course it's not easy, but ultimately it just means that um, highly compensated employees are not getting better benefits. Um, based off plan design or based off of uh, certain ratios uh, throughout the test. And then if it fails, if the plan fails, um, you're required to remedy those results, which may mean making a plan change, um, plan design change, or it could mean taxing uh, those specific associates in that plan year. Um, and then if you don't fail, great, that's awesome. Nobody wants to fail, no one wants to lose. Uh, just keep the results, show that you did what you were supposed to do. You don't have to turn these into anybody, only if the IRS was to audit and ask for them. Um, and then, of course, substantiating your FSA claims, including any health reimbursement accounts that you might have. Uh, we don't know if there's any enforcement on HRAs, but I'm sure they could ask for it because, again, the employer gets a tax write-off for that. Uh, so just make sure you're taxing any ineligible expenses going through the process of trying to substantiate claims. All right. So we've done all three, we're following the rules, we're increasing substantiation to be super helpful. Uh, we're gonna maintain com plan compliance. Um, so yeah, you win. Uh, you guys thought you lost, but uh, here's the deal, I'm a millennial and I don't believe that anyone ever loses. Uh, everyone gets a trophy, <laughs> huge believer in like positive reinforcement. So yeah, you win, but this is really how you win with the IRS. So this is not just me blowing fluff, like this is legit. Um, so let's talk about audit enforcement, just real quick. So the DOL, again, has a super long track record of audits. So I could, with a fair amount of certainty, tell you exactly what they're going to ask for in an audit, okay? Um, that's not the case here. I don't know what the IRS is looking for, except for a handful of things that we've discussed. So I'm gonna tell you the same thing I would tell somebody who's going through a DLL audit. First of all, hire an attorney. That's your first thing that you should do. Um, with DLL audits, we know that if you bring an attorney in early on, they might, one, they're gonna help you. Like they should, you know, be your advocate and your voice. Um, they also can request extra time to respond to the data that they've asked for in an audit. Okay, and here's a trick. This is for DOL stuff, but it could apply to the IRS too. Um, let's say you didn't have a wrap document and they asked for all your plan document information with the DOL. You absolutely could get one in the period of time that they've asked for you by the deadline, right? So let's say they want it by 9.30. You better go get you a wrap and a, and a FSA plan document. Like you can get all those things. So like an attorney helps buy you time 
and can like help direct you into places that would be helpful for you, like getting the things that you need to get. Maybe, um, maybe that includes doing a couple years of non-discrimination testing you never did, just so that you have it. Um, you can do those things as long as you do it by the deadline to turn in the information. Uh, you're going to want to contact your CPA. Why? Because they're the person who does your taxes, <laughs> probably, um, or whoever that person is. You you want them. They're going to need to pull stuff for you. Uh, number three, contact your administrator. Contact your FSA administrator. Uh, they're going to have to give you reporting. They may have to give you additional information, and they really just need to know this is going on to be a support for you. And then make sure you have plan documents, like I said, your testing results. Um, you do have time to get them. Uh, yeah, so get them. Don't delay. Um, and I will say this about the IRS. They've said in the past, in the past, um, you know, and this was in a one-on-one -on -one conversation like we have with them all the time, like, hey, you know, if you didn't do testing, we're not going to ask you to go back 30 years and do it. Do it and go forward. Um, so there haven't been any penalties with that in the past, but again, you know, they're changing stuff just because uh, so yeah, make sure you got all that stuff. This is your audit enforcement checklist that we know right now, and perhaps we can make this a little more uh, substantial in the future as we find out more information, as we meet with the enforcers and the auditors. Okie dokie team, uh, have any questions, any comments, anything you need? Clinical team, if there were any really like hot burning questions, I would love to hear them. Fran, I think you really answered this, but I did get the question in a couple different places. Um, you know, asking about is it okay to, you know, do those copay matches? Is it okay? What about prescriptions when you're, you know, not requesting receipts when swiping mm -hmm. the card for that? Um, and right. then maybe also talk about auto substantiation um, after some a particular item has been substantiated once in a plan year already, and how that those ways of making it easier to substantiate or less burdensome to substantiate are still compliant. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, that's essentially like you just want to make sure that like there are ways to do it. And if a claim has already been substantiated manually, it's not going to substantiate again. Um, it's not going to be considered like an additional claim. Is that is, is that what you're asking or what the yeah. question was, Emily? Like how yeah. is that? Um, my experience with it is it's just kind of kicked out. It doesn't create a brand new claim. Um, especially if you're doing it in that way. But there are also other ways, like you don't necessarily do uh, claims feeds, but you could, do, and it is a claims feed, but you could do something called claims exchange where like some, maybe some employees don't really want their claims auto substantiated for whatever reason. Um, they would have to go in and approve the claim to make sure that it wasn't a duplicate. What are your thoughts on that, Emily? You're the data guru. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I do like claims exchange when it's available. Um, it really, really does make a lot of sense to have it set so that the employee gets to decision the items. Mm -hmm. um, and when they have that availability in a system like what we offer, um, it also offers them the ability to use um, a different claim to offset the receipt need for one that they may not have documentation for that maybe didn't run through insurance, whatever it may be, or maybe it was a small mom and pop store that they didn't you know, doesn't do IIAS merchant substantiation and they threw away the receipt and they need something to clear that need. Um, so yeah, that, that can be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, I mean, we believe in choice, right? Like you should get to choose, although I myself like to be kind of hands off and I, you know, I don't want to touch my FSA account in terms of having to deal with it. And like, that's just me being honest. Like I want it all to work for me. Uh, which is why I actually have an HSA, but like I have a limited purpose FSA. And like when I go to the dentist, I got to deal with this stuff. Um, so anything that's going to make it easier on me as an, as an expert who knows how to navigate this, like I think let's just, yeah, let's make it easy, right? Good yeah. question. Any other questions? Yeah, so we got a question saying, do you send the notification of needed documentation at the year end by email? 
Um, and I think I can actually answer this pretty well. Um, we're sending the requests for needed documentation to employees as those claims are occurring. And we're sending requests for documentation multiple times. There's multiple reminders. Um, but we're also sending to you as the employer um, a report monthly that's called the repayments report. At least Pinnacle is. I don't know what all the other TPAs do, but this is what we do. Um, notifying you of potential repayments needed to the plan. Um, and that's going to be where people haven't submitted the documentation and that documentation need is overdue. And we've flipped that switch, if you will, to say that something's been denied because they didn't submit what they needed to. Does that make sense? Cheryl says she guess she needs to look at those reports then. Uh-oh. Well, and, and Cheryl, here's the deal. Like we know that like, you know, it's possible that like maybe you got these in the past. Like a lot of people and like just didn't really pay any mind to them. Like it's time to start. It's all good. Like don't don't sweat it. Just be like, yeah, now it's time to kind of take a peek. So that's a good attitude to have. Yeah. Um, Let's see, can an employee only elect dependent care FSA during the enrollment or do they have to? So Cheryl, as far as like um, open and, and like mid-year events, um, this really just depends on plan design. I mean, most plans are gonna allow somebody who has, um, you know, the birth of a child in the middle of the year to allow them to make an election then. Oh, because you wouldn't really want, I mean, I know that like if I don't have a child, there's really, why would I elect dependent care? Like, so people can elect it after they the birth of their children. That's that's usually fine. Oh, and I've got a an answer for Michelle Young. She had kind of an ongoing question that Leslie started to answer. Um, she's asking um, from the perspective of a small employer. She offers an HSA compatible plan. Does she, as the employer, have to you know make sure that documentation is being um, you know, gathered and held in case of audit. And the answer for that is that you as the employer are not required to make sure that, you know, claims against HSAs are substantiated because HSAs are individually owned accounts and the employee yeah. is responsible. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Now, yeah, and even an employer really wouldn't even want to mess with that. Like, not only do you not have to, you don't want to. And there's a lot of reasons why you just don't want to mess with people and their HSAs and like how they're managing it. Um, a lot of that comes from the fact that they're not subject to ERISA and you don't want them to be. Uh, but you do need a Section 125 plan document that allows you, um, that, that puts in writing that you're pre-taxing things. Um, they're super easy to get. It's a POP document. We prepare them uh, for a fee for our clients. Um, and you just keep it and put it in a drawer in case you ever need it. And that's, um, that's the gist of it. It's just like a little friend to keep in your drawer <laughs> and help you that you never actually have to, um, like hand it to anybody. And here's the deal with pop documents, you're not required to distribute them. Unlike FSA documents, you are, but I mean, it's the best practice to give the documents to your employees. So just letting you know, you don't have to give them to the IRS unless they ask for it. I think we've answered all of the questions. And if there's any other burning topics, uh, we'll just give everybody a couple more minutes to, to shoot those in. Just know that you can also send us a message at health at pnfp.com with any follow-up questions that you might have. Uh, we're always happy to answer questions. And then, of course, you know, if there's like, you feel like you forgot something, certainly reach out and you'll get a recording to this. Um, so you can go back and play it over and over again and then um, feel really good about it. <laughs> How far are the audits going back? Um, right now, we don't know. We don't know. We just know they're auditing for a period of time. Um, my understanding is it's, it's probably going to go as far back as the IRS is auditing you for for your corporate tax return. Um, but my hope is that it's a shorter period of time. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that we get more information so that we can really give people um, 
you know, less butterflies and more good feelings about, you know, knowing what to expect. But we do know they're not going back to plan inception. So if you've been offering a pre-tax plan since 2000, they're probably not going to go back that far, you know. Usually the look back for the DOL at least is three years to start with. So I would just think in my mind like, hey, these, these uh, regulatory bodies work together very often. They create things together as part of EBSA. Uh, so they may follow suit with one another. Callie, did I answer your question? Does the same filing apply for HSAs? I think that was about substantiation. Do I have that right, or is there another filing I'm, I'm thinking about? I just want to make sure I got that for you. Well, um, Callie, feel free to reach out. I, you know, you can always give me a call. You can shoot us an email at help at pnfp.com if we didn't answer your question. But yeah, uh, so we want to thank everybody for coming. And again, reach out to us. Uh, we hope you had fun and we're really glad that you came. So uh, yeah, we'll chat soon. We appreciate all of you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks. You're welcome.